Hello, and welcome to your second Transformers lecture. Today, we're finally going to get to attention, which apparently is all you need in the Transformer architecture. In the previous lecture, we talked about what happens to vectors as we process them in order to prepare them to go into the Transformer network. We talked about some things that might be familiar, like word embeddings, where we take words and we create non-sparse, hopefully low-density vectors that allow us to represent the semantic meaning of a word. We then added something called positional encoding, which injects information about an item's position in a sequence into the word representation. This allows us to feed all of the words in a sequence to the model at one time, rather than processing them sequentially. But let's take a tour of the rest of the transformer architecture. Before we do, I just want to remind you that this specific transformer laid out in the paper is used for machine translation, which means it needs both this encoder and this decoder stack. However, technically, you can use an encoder by itself or a decoder by itself, and at the very end, we'll talk about some models that do just that. First up, let's look at the encoder layer. The encoder layer is actually a stack of n different encoder layers that look exactly like this. The job of an encoder layer is to take in a sequence and create a hidden representation of that sequence. The encoder layer has two sublayers. First, what we're going to focus on today, which is multi-headed attention, and then it goes through just a simple feed forward layer. The decoder layer has a lot of things that look very similar to the encoder. And again, the job of a decoder is to take a hidden representation and produce a new sequence. Just like the encoder layer, the decoder layer has multiple sublayers. First, it has a masked multi-headed attention, then it has a regular multi-headed attention, and then of course, like the encoder, it has a simple feed forward layer. Last but not least, we have the token generator. And even though it's not technically part of the decoder layer, it takes the output of the decoder layer, feeds it through a dense layer, and allows us to actually make predictions about which item should be next in a sequence. All right, now that we've had an overview of the transformer architecture, let's finally talk about attention. Before we do, I just want to show you this meme. While we're going to talk about a lot of math today, I want you to remember that attention, at least the attention mechanism we're going to cover today, is really just doing this, taking a bunch of vectors, multiplying them together, scaling them, and putting them through a softmax function. And so even though some of what we talk about might seem a little bit difficult or complicated, remember that's all that's happening when we talk about actual attention. Conceptually, attention asks models to learn what specifically it should pay attention to in order to do its task, like predict the next word or classify an image. In a convolutional architecture, attention would look like a mask that tells the model what pixels are important in classifying this image, for instance, as a cat. This can help our model filter out unnecessary information while putting a very high weight on useful information. In a sequential model where we're processing sequences like sentences, we can think of attention like this. In this matrix, we're looking at the sentence, the frog crawled to the bank. And you can see that we have entries for every combination of each word with any other word in the sentence. If we look at a single column in this matrix, this basically gives us an idea of how important each word in the sentence is to pay attention to when processing the meaning of the word bank. For instance, we have two very common ways to use the word bank, like a river bank or like a money bank. Here we can see that it's obviously very important to pay attention to the word bank when processing the word bank, but also, it looks like it's really important to look at the words frog and crawled in order to tell us a little bit more context about the word bank. However, these words like to and the don't really have a huge impact on the meaning of the word bank. And of course, each of the columns in this matrix represents that same information, but for each individual word in the sequence. For instance, when looking at the word crawled, we need to pay special attention to the words frog and the words think. And this is exactly what attention is in a transformer. We're basically looking to create a matrix of values that tells us the relative importance of paying attention to different words when processing a given word in the sequence. For instance, in this sentence, the train left the station on time. 
we don't necessarily know what type of station it's talking about. Is it talking about a space station or a radio station or maybe a train station? You can see from this matrix that when processing the word station, we have very high attention values on the words train and left because those give us good context that helps us understand what type of station this might be. If we pull a column from this matrix, like the column for station, we can use these values as weights to create something called a context-aware vector. A context-aware vector basically takes a combination of all of the different words in the sequence weighted by their attention scores, so higher attention scores means a higher weight, and combines them to create that context-aware vector. This is a new vector representation of our word that now includes context from the different words around it. Theoretically, the way we calculate these is with a formula like this. Here, we're basically creating new word vectors for each word by taking a sum of the weights generated by the attention scores times all of the different words in the sentence. So we're creating a linear combination of all the words in a sequence that allow us to infer the contextual meaning of our actual word. Words that have really high attention scores will have really high weights meaning that more of their information is included in the context of our new context-aware vector. So again, we're going to take these weights, attention weights in this case, and we're gonna multiply them by each embedding. So each word in the sequence has an attention weight higher if that word is important to understand the context of our current word and lower if it's not important. We then take the sum of these and we output our context-aware vector, which now incorporates meaning both from itself as well as all of the different vectors in its sequence. One important thing to note is that these weights need to sum up to one. Now that we've seen the math, I think we can understand this graphic a little better. First, we're creating a matrix that tells us the relative importance of paying attention to different words in the sequence. Then, for each word, we're going to take its column of scores and use them as weights to create a context-aware vector by combining meaning from all of the different words in our sequence using their weights and then outputting this context-aware vector. So that's how attention works generally. So how do we apply that to transformers specifically? Transformers use the concepts of queries, keys, and values to describe the way it uses attention. You're probably familiar with queries. Queries are basically us making a request for something. For instance, we might create a query of dogs on the beach, which is asking for an image with dogs on the beach. In this case, the keys are different features that appear in that image. For instance, here we're looking at beaches, trees, boats, etc. In order to figure out which value we would like to look at, we take our query, compare it to the different keys we have, and see which ones match the best. For instance, if we're looking for dogs on the beach, this image here matches the best because it's the only one that has both dogs and a beach. So to review, conceptually, queries are basically requests for what we're looking for. Keys basically give us an idea of what we have to offer, and we'll look for a high match between our query and our key. Once we know which query and key match the best, we can then choose the best value based on those queries and keys. And these are the ideas behind what transformers do. They create these vectors, the query, the key, and the value by taking all of our word embeddings, so this is the same exact input for all three of these vectors, and they multiply them by a weight matrix. These weight matrices are full of learnable parameters, which are what are trained when we're training our transformers. These are also different for each attention head, but we'll get to that a little bit later. So what we're doing here is we're taking our word embeddings and we are projecting them into different spaces that we've learned via these weight matrices. This results in our queries, our keys, and our values. Just a quick note, the weight matrices for queries and keys must be the same size, but the ones for the values could be a different size. It is a little confusing though because in the paper, attention is all you need, all three of them have the exact same size. 
So these queries, keys, and values that we generate by applying a weight matrix to our embeddings are then fed all three together into our attention head. In the paper, they use something called scaled dot product attention, which uses this formula in order to create our attention values. And again, now that we're seeing some formulas, I just want to remind you that even though we're talking about difficult conceptual things like queries and keys and values and projecting data into different dimensions, attention is literally just taking some vectors, multiplying them together a lot, and putting them through a softmax function. All right, so let's look at each part of this formula. When we looked at attention for sequences before, we had a matrix that told us the relative importance of paying attention to different items in the sequence. This is created with this part of the function. This as a whole creates our attention weight. The first thing we need to do in order to calculate these attention weights is multiply our queries and our keys together. This will give us an idea of which queries are similar to which keys, and thus which ones we should pay the most attention to. This is represented in this part of the scaled dot product attention graph in the attention is all you need paper. Now, when we do this multiplication of queries times keys, we might end up with values that have a lot higher variance than the queries or keys themselves. In order to make sure everything is on a much similar scale, we are going to scale our values by the square root of dk, which again is the dimensions of both our queries and our keys. This scaling is represented here in the scale dot product attention graphic. Last but not least, we need all of our weights to add up to one, and so we're going to send the values that we just created through a softmax function. Again, that's represented here in the graphic. Now that we've done that, we've created all the attention weights that we need in order to create these context-aware vectors. So the final step in doing that is taking the weights that we just generated and multiplying them by the values. Together, represented here in the diagram, this will give us our context-aware vectors. So again, to review, we take our queries, our keys, and our values and feed them into an attention head. First, we're going to multiply our queries and our keys, which is basically a way of seeing which queries and keys match. The ones that match will likely have higher scores and therefore be more important to pay attention to when processing the context of a word. Then, because this multiplication can create quite large numbers, we are going to scale them so that they're on a relatively similar scale as the queries and the keys. Last, once we've created these weights, we are going to feed them through a softmax function so that all of our weights add up to 1. Finally, we will take our weights and we will multiply them by the values in order to create these context-aware vectors. Now, you might have noticed that in the previous diagram, I skipped a part of the scale dot product attention diagram, masking. Masking is optional, but what it does is it takes the weights that we've generated by scaling and multiplying our queries and our keys and masks the upper right corner. In our encoder, we have access to every single item in a sequence when we feed it in. However, in our decoder, that will not always be the case. In our decoder, we only have access to words in a sequence that come before our current word. Notice that this is the only attention head that has masked in front of it. Because we can only consider words that come before, we need to take the weights that we just generated and mask the ones that are related to items that come after our current word in the sequence. The way we do that is we take the matrix that we've generated and we set the upper right triangle to be negative infinity. When we send a negative infinity through a softmax function, these values will all become zero, essentially masking them out and not allowing our model to consider the context that comes from items later in a sequence. Again, this only really needs to happen in the decoder layer because in the encoder layer, we're guaranteed to have access to our entire sequence. Now that you know a little bit about what attention is and how we create context-aware vectors based on paying attention to different words in the sequence, let's talk a little bit about cross-attention. You may have noticed that in our decoder, we technically have two multi-headed attention layers. In the second multi-headed attention layer, our queries are actually coming from the decoder, but our keys and values are coming from the encoder. 
you can see this represented here in the diagram where our keys and our values are coming from the encoder layer and our queries are coming from the decoder. This is called cross-attention because we're combining information from our hidden representation from the encoder as well as information from our decoder, the queries, the things we're looking for. All right, so now we've talked thoroughly about each part of our scaled dot product attention. Taken together, this entire process is called an attention head. It takes in queries, keys, and values, and then creates attention scores, multiplies those by our values, and then outputs context-aware vectors for all of our different items in the sequence. If we are working in the decoder, we may also mask our weights so that we're not considering items later on in a sequence. Now, a single attention head seems complicated enough, but actually in transformers, they use something called multi-head attention. Multi-head attention basically says that we have multiple attention heads, each which are supposed to learn different things to pay attention to. So instead of having a single attention head, we take our embeddings and we feed them into multiple attention heads, each which have their own weights to create the queries, the keys, and the values. These are then all fed through their own scaled dot product attentions, and at the end, we take the output from each of our heads and concatenate it, which basically means we squish it all together in one object. So first we'd have the output from the first head, then the second head, then the third head, then the fourth head, etc. This then is the output of the multi-headed attention layer, not just the results from a single attention head, but from all of our attention heads. Because we have different attention heads with different weight matrices, it allows us to learn different things about the sequence. For instance, one head might pay attention to the tenths of things, and the other might pay attention to the subject in a sentence. Each of these attention heads gets the same input, our embedding vectors, but separately and independently learns the different weight matrices that allow it to pay attention to different things. All right, you may have also noticed that in the transformer architecture, we also have a couple different ways that we are regularizing our model. First one is that we normalize the output of our layers. This is something that we've done before through batch norm. Second, we use residual connections. Remember, residual connections take an undisturbed copy of our information and feed it through a separate pass so that while a copy of that information is being processed, the other copy remains unchanged. At the end of the process, we then combine these two things together so that the information in our original data isn't lost, but we also get the benefit of all of that processing that we're doing. In the transformer architecture, you can see that every time we have a sublayer, we also have a layer normalization. This means that the output of our different sublayers, like the multi-headed attention layers, are normalized after they are output. We also have residual connections in each sublayer. This means that as we take our information and process it through a multi-headed attention layer, we also take a copy of that information, don't change it, and add it back to our output once we're done processing our multi-headed attention. All right, that was a lot of information, but today we learned a lot about attention and all of the different parts of a transformer. In the last lecture, we talked a little bit about positional encoding and word embeddings, which prepare our words to enter our transformer model. Today, we talked a lot about attention, and specifically multi-headed attention, which is what the transformer uses. In each of our encoder layers, remember there's n of them, we have two sublayers. The first sublayer sends our data into a multi-headed attention layer. We take our word embeddings and we project them so that they become our query, our key, and our value vectors. We then feed these into an attention mechanism, which uses our queries and keys to figure out what we should pay attention to, and then applies that to our values to create context-aware vectors. These are then fed through a typical feed-forward layer. On the decoder side, we have some really similar things happening. First, we have another multi-headed attention layer, except this is masked multi-headed attention. This accounts for the fact that in our output sequence, we won't be able to consider future words in the sequence like we would when we can process the entire sequence in the encoder. We create this mask by taking the upper right triangle of the matrix and setting all of its values to negative infinity. 
That way, when we send it through the softmax function, these values will become zero, essentially removing them from consideration when generating our context-aware vectors. We then have a second multi-headed attention layer. This one does cross attention because the keys and the values come from the encoder, but the queries, what we're looking for, come from the decoder. Last but not least, like in the encoder, we feed this through a typical feed forward layer. Once the decoder is done processing things, we send it through this token generator, which actually tells us what words we should output based on the output of the decoder. We also talked about the benefit of multi-headed attention, which allows us to not only have one attention head, but multiple so that different attention heads can pay attention to different things. And last but not least, we talked about the various ways in which the transformer implements regularization, for instance, through layer normalization, as well as through residual connections. Now, I mentioned earlier in the lecture that transformers have pretty much taken over sequence processing in deep learning models. In fact, you're probably aware of a lot of different transformer models that are out there in the real world. For instance, a really common model in natural language processing for doing things like text classification is the model BERT, which is an encoder-only transformer model. And of course, I know all of you have heard of this decoder-only transformer model, which is GPT. GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer, so of course it's a transformer model. And last but not least, there are a ton of encoder-decoder transformers out there, especially in things like machine translation. Transformer models really revolutionize the way we process sequences in deep learning. Before then, we were really stuck with recurrent architectures like a LSTM or a GRU. Transformers are a lot faster and allow us to do things that we just couldn't do. Transformers really speed up the amount of information we can process at one time and therefore make more efficiently trained models, which is probably why they've taken over. All right, that's all I have for you. I will see you next time.